yet how or why, I cannot tell, he should have lifted me. From sinking sand, he lifted me. With tender hand, he lifted me. From shades of night, to plains of light, oh, praise his name. He lifted me. Amen. Now turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter number 14, and when you find that, turn over to Isaiah chapter number 38. 1 Kings 14, verse number 9 is what we'll be looking at. We're going to start by reading just two verses, but um, we will read a considerably amount more than that uh, over the course of the, the message. In 1 Kings chapter number 14, verse number 9, once you get there, turn with me to Isaiah 38, 17. We'll start in 1 Kings, and then we'll go to Isaiah. I want to show you two different phrases, and quite frankly, if you are reading Scripture uh, through, these portions of Scripture are so separated by the sheer amount of volumes of words that it's very rare, probably, that anybody would read these two in one sitting at the same time. But I want to show you a contrast between two different verses this morning that are very staggering, quite frankly. If you made it to 1 Kings chapter number 14, you will find in verse number 9 it says this. Uh, Jeroboam is the object of the king here that we're, we're speaking about. Uh, the man of God here is speaking to Jeroboam's wife about Jeroboam. It says, but, the, but has done evil talking about Jerob Jeroboam, but hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molded images to provoke me to anger and hast cast me behind thy back. Now here's God speaking, and we'll read a little bit more of this in a little bit, but here's God speaking to the wife of Jeroboam and is directed to Jeroboam. And he says, you've done more evil than any king that has ever preceded you. And you have cast me behind your back. Or can I put it into a word or phrase that we would more commonly use today? I'm not trying to change scripture. I'm just, listen, this is what you and I would say in today's, uh, today's terms. You turned your back on me. That's what God said to Jeroboam. You turned your back on me. Travel with me to Isaiah. Isaiah, of course, is the prophet of God under King Hezekiah, who was a good king. Uh, he came to power when he was about 25 years old and uh, really had a great revival in the nation. He turned the nation to God, not only himself, but the nation to God. And he got sick and, and was going to die, and, and uh, he prayed to God. And this is kind of some of the words that he had said to him, verse number 17, Isaiah chapter number 38, verse 17, it says, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. The contrast between these two verses is staggering. You find in 1 Kings, you find that God is speaking to a king, and then in Isaiah, you find a king is speaking to God. In 1 Kings, you find a sinner casting God behind his back, a sinner turning his back on God. And then in Isaiah, you find a good king who says, God has cast my sin behind his back. Two different concepts, two different statements, God casting something behind his back, and you and I casting something behind our back. Can I, for a moment, just contrast these about what we can do to turn our back on God or to turn to God? For a moment, just for a brief moment, really, I, I don't believe this will be a long message because it's a very singular point. I'd like to spend some time with you about Jeroboam and Hezekiah and the difference it makes about our attitude towards God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for so much of the scripture that is given to us, Father, and how that we can take out these things, Father, and to be able to help us to be able to grow and to be able to do better with our life, Father. Lord, help us never to have had something said to us uh, or about us, Lord, that we had turned our back on you. Lord, I pray you would help us to see that we should strive to serve you in a very singular and forthwith kind of a manner, Father. Bless us as we study this, and I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
keep your finger in Isaiah, uh, or if you got one of those little marker things in your Bible, we will be back, but it'll be about 20 minutes, so we will be back. But go back with me to 1 Kings for a moment and look at chapter number 11. Some portions of Scripture need a great deal of explanation. Quite frankly, they're hard for us to understand. Sometimes it's due to the lack of uh, the fact that we grew up in a Western civilization, and so Eastern culture is kind of foreign to us, and we have to have some of those things explained. Uh, sometimes it's, it's a matter of living in a postmodern world and not understanding uh, some of the things that would have been general knowledge when the Scripture was written, for instance, farming and, and things of that nature. Many of us maybe have never even, uh, never even put anything in the ground. We just go to H-E-B, you know what I mean? And so by nature of, of living in a postmodern world, some things are more difficult, and so we have to, we have to uh, do that. Some of it is region-specific, understanding what a mustard tree is or, or you know, some of the, the region-specific things. Some portions of Scripture need a great deal of explanation. I mean, that's just the way it is. Some portions of Scripture are very self-explanatory. We are in a portion of Scripture, both of these, that are pretty self-explanatory. God said, you've cast me behind your back. That's pretty, that's a, that, you've turned your back on me. I would say that that needs very little explanation. When Hezekiah says to God, he says, you've cast my sin behind your back, that's pretty self-explanatory. But together, when we contrast these two statements, we see something um, much more wonderful, I would say. In 1 Kings chapter number 11, you'll find a sinner casting God behind his back or, or the build up to it. In verse number 28 of chapter number 11, you'll find that Jeroboam is here. He is a man that has risen to power as king of ten tribes of the nation of Israel, ten of twelve, as a result of God rising him to that position. In verse number, uh, chapter number 20, or chapter number 11, verse number 28, it says this. And the man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor. And Solomon, seeing the young man, that he was industrious, he made him ruler over all the charge of the house of Joseph. And it came to pass at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shulamite, uh, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and rent it in twelve pieces, and said to, to Jeroboam, Take the ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to thee. But he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake, and in Jerusalem, or for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do that which is right in mine eyes, and to keep my statutes and my judgments, as did David his father. Howbeit I will not take the whole kingdom out of this, his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life for David my servant's sake whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hands and will give it unto thee, even ten tribes. And unto his son will I give it one tribe, that David, my servant, may have a light always before me in Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen me to put my name therein or there. And I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel." And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. And I, and I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt, unto Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Solomon, many of you know wisdom of Solomon. Solomon was a very wise man, and, and the beginning of his life did, did turn his heart to God and ask God for wisdom. God said, I'll give you, you'll be the wisest man that ever lived. And then you go back and read Ecclesiastes. We have a, this is, I don't have time for the entire history of Israel this morning, but Solomon, has heart turned from God at some point in his life, 
probably when he began to multiply wives of different heathen nations, and they brought in, guess what they brought in with them? By the way, when you marry, this is a topic you ought to take very considerable care about. You shouldn't marry somebody who does not believe in God because they will turn your heart from God. Ask all the men in the Bible who have done so. Go look at people's lives. It, it, it needs to be a factor. Nevertheless, the Bible very clearly commands us not to be unequally yoked. That's a side note. Solomon married all these women who worshipped other gods, and guess what happened? They began to bring their idols with them, and they turned the hearts of the people. And here we are in 1 Kings chapter number 11, and now the nation of Israel, the whole nation, the 12 tribes under, under Solomon, the last time it's a, it's a joint kingdom, is worshipping Ashtaroth and, and Chemosh and Milcom, and, and these other gods of the other nations around them, instead of worshiping God Almighty, they're worshiping idols. Gods, there are no gods. I have always find it interesting when the Philistine god of Dagon, he's, a, he's kind of a fish god, and he's kind of have a fish head and, 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 and hands, of course. And when the Ark of the Covenant was there in the, in the temple of Dagon, it, it, they came in in the morning, the priest came in the morning, and, and Dagon had fell over, you remember? And he broke his hands off and his head off and, uh, you know, over a course of a couple of days he kept falling over. They had to come into their temple and pick their God up because their God needed their help. Listen, my God doesn't need my help. He, he has allowed me to help him, but he doesn't need it. My God created the world. He doesn't need me to pick him up. I don't have to glue his hands back on. He has power to do it himself, not that his hands would fall off. You understand that they had brought gods who are no gods into their, into their nation and abandoned God Almighty. Because of that, God says to Jeroboam, through the prophet, I'm going to rend ten tribes away from uh, Solomon's seat and split the nation. He said, I'm not going to take it away because of David's sake, completely. And so... I'm going to give ten tribes to you. The, the great majority of Israel would have been under the power of Jeroboam. Solomon finds out about it and it tries to kill Jeroboam uh, after he already is. He's really nice. I mean, he's a good guy at the beginning of this story, okay? Uh, and he flees to Egypt, and then he comes back after the death of Solomon. His rise to power was told to him that he would be king by God Almighty. And when God tells you something's going to happen, guess what? It will happen. There's a reason to believe that he was a follower of God. You say, what do you mean by that? God spoke to him, didn't he? And he came to him and told him that as long as he would do what he was supposed to do, that God would bless him. You'll find that he named his firstborn son. And, and, and go with me to chapter number 14. Yes. And at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. The, word, the, the, the name Abijah means... Jehovah is my father, or it can be translated, Jehovah is my desire. There's a there's reason to believe that, that Jeroboam feared God. He even named his son, Jehovah is my father, or Jehovah is my, my uh, desire. There is reason to believe that when he fled to, he fled to Egypt and the prophecy, uh, under the prophecy under the duration of Solomon's reign, and after his death he returned, and God did give him the northern ten tribes of Israel. But he turned his back on God. You see, God turned to Jeroboam and asked Jeroboam to lead the nation of Israel in his commandments, in his statutes. And Jeroboam forgot all about it, that God rose him to power. And as soon as he got in the position of being blessed by God, he turned his back on God. You say, what do you mean by that? In chapter number 12, we recount in verse number 26 what happened in Jeroboam's life. If you, look at, if you look at verse number 26, and forgive me for the, the, the great deal of the history behind this, but I think it illuminates the phrase that he turned his back on God. In verse number 26 through 33, we find here that he began to worry about something. He, he began to worry about losing what God had given him. Can I tell you something for a moment? If God gives you something, it's going to take God to take it away. You can give it up. Or God will take it away, but nobody else is going to take it away from you because God is the one who put you there. God's the one who blessed you with that. Why would he allow someone to rip it away unless that was his will? So here he comes to power. In verse number 28, he is put on the throne. In verse, or chapter, the rest of chapter number 12, the beginning of it, 
uh, Rehoboam, which is Solomon's son, uh, defies the counsel of the old man. He doesn't listen to the word of God. He, he completely rejects all that. He causes a civil war for a few, and the nation of Israel is split between the ten tribes, the northern ten tribes, and Judah and Benjamin, uh, the lower ten tribes of Israel. And so you'll find here that he is, in verse number 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Well, let's go back for a minute. Uh, verse 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of the, this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Jer Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So he, he finds himself a, a problem here. He, he lives in a religious system, uh, for a lack of a better word. The, the old Judaic law, the Mosaic law that we find in New the Old Testament uh, in Leviticus, predominantly in some in Exodus, and then De Deuteronomy as well, where they were required by God's command to sacrifice. And, and no less than six times, all the nation of Israel gathered in Jerusalem at the temple every year, no less than six times. And that means that they went down there for religious duties, for, uh, for Passover, for uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, for, for many of these times where they would go and they would worship God collectively as a nation. They were required to do this by God's law six times a year. And so Rehoboam was thinking to himself, here I am, a separate nation. And if my people, Jewish people, go to Israel or to Jerusalem and worship, at some point they're going to want to be part of that country and they're going to revolt. You see where his thinking was? He was using man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom. God said, I'll give you this kingdom, and he also said, you'll keep it, and you'll be blessed if. There's a big if. By the way, most of God's promises have an if to them. You realize that, right? If a man stands up or a woman stands up and tells you that God's going to make everything, it's going to be the wonderful life that you've always wanted and that God's going to bless you, God will bless you if. There's always an if. God has ifs. There is, all of his promises are almost always predicated on our behavior. You'll find that him, he says to himself, I've got a problem. If my people continue to serve God, they're going to go down to Jerusalem and they're going to kill me and revolt and go back to Rehoboam. Verse 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods of Israel, O Israel which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other in, he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people, went, uh, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places, and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month of the fifteenth day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar... So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had de devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. You'll find that this coincides with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the greatest uh, uh, day in Old Testament Jewish religion as far as uh, atonement of sin. So he made up his own. And he made up his own altar. And he made his own God. Why? Because he was afraid. He began to turn his back on the very God that put him and blessed him and began his process, his downward spiral away from God began at this very moment. He began to fear God, or fear man rather than God. He was, a, he was not afraid of what, uh, what God would say about his action. He was afraid about what men would do to him. I'll tell you that all too often today, you and I will be more afraid of the people around us than God Almighty. And I don't mean the kind of fear that is, uh, can, I, can I qualify the fear of God that you and I should have? We're not to be afraid of God in the sense that we are cowering in a corner, sniffling and, and crying. Okay, The fear of God that we have, and I always use the stove as an analogy, because it's it's a, I mean, I, I don't like getting burnt. Anybody enjoy being burned? No, I didn't think so. It's probably one of the most painful things you can go through is burn. Nothing seems to help a burn. There's a stove in my kitchen, and I am not. I, every time I walk into my kitchen, I don't 
uh, begin to bawl and, and cry and cower in the corner because I know that thing can hurt me. Y'all with me? I'm not, I am not afraid of my stove, but I do have a fear of it. It's a healthy respect. You see, when that, when that eye is red and glowing, or if you have gas, which, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have gas, that's amazing. But if you have a fire coming right out of that gas, you know, uh, you, you know what you don't do? You don't touch it. Thank you, Bill. That's pretty obvious, though, isn't it? You don't touch it. Why? Because you're afraid of it. You have a fear of it. You have a fear of what it can do to you. It, it's not going to hurt you unless you get out of line, right? I mean, the stove's not going to bother you unless you do something that you're not supposed to do, like put your hand on it. You see, we have a healthy respect. I'm not saying that God's a stove. I hope you understand that. My point is, is I was trying to illustrate the two types of fear that we should have. One is a healthy respect, and the other one is a terrified, freezing kind of fear. We're not to have that kind of fear about God. You see, God loves you and I. I can tell you, when I was growing up as a kid, I had a healthy respect for my father. Y'all with me? I mean, some people have a terrified fear of their father, and they shouldn't have. They, that means they don't have a very loving father. But I had a loving father. I wasn't afraid of him. When he walked in the room, I didn't start crying. But I was, did have a healthy fear of him. I wasn't going to step out of line because I sure knew what would happen. You see, I have a fear of God. And instead, Jeroboam does not have a fear of God. He has a fear of man. He's more worried about what man would think, do, or possibly come up with than serving God and what God would do. He doesn't just set up one altar to a false god. He sets up two. And he goes right back to Aaron at the foot of the mount there. And Moses wouldn't come down. And they said, hey, why don't you make us a god? And what does he make? A golden calf. It's amazing that this golden calf keeps coming back every single time. Not just one this time, but two. He pulled an entire nation into sin in order to secure his own situation. If we're not careful, by the way, your sin affects other people. The things that you and I sin in our life, do you realize that we're pulling people with us? You say, but I don't, I'm not in charge of anybody. It doesn't matter. People watch you. you. You see, you and I don't live on an island to ourselves, and the things that we do affects other people. He trusted in everything else except for God Almighty. He pulled an entire nation down with himself. He lacked faith in God. There was an in, he, he could not believe that God would be able to keep him in the place that God put him. God said, I'm going to put you in, uh, in this nation, and I will bless you. He says, in chapter number 11, let's see, verse number uh, 37. I will take thee, and thou shalt reign according to all that thy soul desireth, and shalt be king over Israel. And it shall be, if thou wilt hearken unto all that I command thee, and wilt walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David thy father, thy, my servant did, that I will be with thee, and build thee a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel unto thee. Do you realize what God promised him? If you will obey me, I will build you a sure house, a house that is solid, one that cannot be overthrown. God said that he'd build that house, that he would build that reign. And what happened? He turned his back on God. He trusted in worldly wisdom. He, he got together with the people there, and he took counsel, it says in verse number 28. And he began to think, what can we do to solve this problem? And he went everywhere but God. To solve his problem. His sin seemed even more heinous after reading chapter number 11 and verse number 33. Look at this. It says, because that they have forsaken me and have worshipped Astaroth and the goddess of the Zidonians and, and these other false gods, because the very reason why he came to power was the worship of false gods in the nation of Israel, it seems to me even more heinous of a crime against God that after he is blessed by God that he would take the nation into that same very sin is the reason why he is king. But God sends him a warning. Verse number 13, or chapter 13, verse number 1. It says, Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. 
And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priests of the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall burn upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when uh, when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which he had cried against the altar of, in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. The altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me that my hand may be restored me again. And the man of God besought the Lord, uh, and the king's hand was restored him again, because it was as it was before. So here he is, the, the man of God comes and says, listen, there's going to be a king that is going to rise up, Josiah, which comes out later in, in, uh, in, in the course of history, and he's going to set things back in order. Nevertheless, um, he says, he puts his hands out towards him, you know, and points at him and says, basically seize them, and and his hand withers, and he's not able to pull it back. And, and so he says, pray to th thy God. You notice that? that now it's no longer Josiah's, or not Josiah, uh, uh, Jeroboam's God anymore because he had abandoned God to these calves. He had turned his back on God. His hand is restored miraculously. And you and I would think that would get our attention. Would that not get your attention? Listen, I enjoy the use of my hands. And if my hand withered to the point where I couldn't bring it back anymore, that I had lost the use of one of my hands, and then God miraculously gave it my, my hand's ability back to me, listen, that would wake me up in a heartbeat, or at least I would hope so. And I think that you could place yourself in this shoe, the shoes of Jeroboam for a minute, and you got this going on, and you're worried about these things, and you've just seen God's prophecy come through in your life. God's placed you on the throne uh, of the ten tribes of Israel as a result of idolatry or placing other gods before God. And then you find yourself serving other gods. The man of God comes and says, what you're doing is wrong and you need to stop. And a miracle happens in your life. You would think that'd wake you up. God sent his warning, but he refused to listen. He didn't change anything, and he kept going. He got, his son got sick. Go to chapter number 14 for a minute. Or, or look at verse number 33 for just a moment of the same chapter. It says, uh, after this thing, Jeroboam returned not from his evil way, but made again of the lowest of the people priests of the high places. Uh, whosoever would, he con concentrated him, and he became one of the priests of the high places. And the thing became sin unto the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. God not only blessed him when he failed God and turned his back on God, God gave him a chance to repent of that sin and turn back. And then he still refused after a miraculous sign from God, and he continued. And God says now, in verse 34, and this thing, because sin uh, because it became sin into the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the face of the earth. And God says, now I am going to deal with this. You'll find in verse number 1 that after God says that, of chapter 14, and at that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. He refused to listen to God. He refused to listen to the word of God. He refused to listen to the man of God. And his son got sick. And then what does he do? Does like every other person in the world. We do whatever we want to do. And when trouble comes, and it's beyond our scope to deal with it, what do we do? We run as to God as fast as we can to solve our problems. We don't need him before that. But as soon as we have no solution of our own, we run to God. But Jeroboam doesn't just run to God. He sends his wife in disguise to run to God. In verse number 17 of chapter 14, it says, And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tizrath, uh, uh, Tirzath. And when she came into the threshold of the door, the child died. She went to God. They're God's man. And the prophet said that the, the kingdom would be rent from Jeroboam. 
his house would be destroyed. Every single man child he had would die. And the kingdom would be given to another man. And he said, as a sign of this, as soon as you get home, and as soon as you walk over that threshold, Abijah will die. And that's what happened. Because of his refusal to listen to God, the fact that he turned his back on God, it cost him everything. The fact, the fact of the matter is, is we are all born with our backs to God. You realize that, right? The Bible says that... Uh, and for the wages of sin is death, and, but the gift of God is eternal life. The Bible says in Romans that for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all been born with our backs turned to God. You and I have inherently turned our back on God in favor of sin all our lives. Until God comes to us one day and says, listen, you have a sin debt that you owe. The sin, the wages of sin, is death. The death it's speaking of is not just the physical death, but eternal death in hell. And so God says to you and I, through the word of God, he says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're born with our backs to God. We're born with, with turning our back on God and doing whatever we want to do and going down the way that we want to go. And listen, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to take a field trip to the nursery and see that babies are sinners. That's the reason why... Parenting is so difficult because we, we, we bring into this world baby sinners and they do whatever they want to do until they're trained otherwise. And they push and they shove and they steal and they lie. I mean, it's inherent in them. Nobody teaches kids to lie. They just do it. Nobody teaches kids to take more than they're told or to steal cookies out of the cookie jar or to push or to snatch toys. It never has to be taught, does it? I mean, I was never taught that. Any of y'all were taught that? It wasn't taught. We just do it. Why? Because we're sinners. And we're born with our backs to God. We don't care anything about what God has to say. We only care about the most important person in the whole world to us. Me. Well, or you. I'm not the most important person in the whole world to you. We only care about self. And God says the result of that is you have sinned against my law. Time and time and time again, you haven't even cared. The punishment that is for that sin is death and hell. But God says, I love you so much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You see, Jesus Christ came to not just to die on the cross for my sin or for a select number of people's sins, but the sins of every human being that has ever existed and ever will. Why? Because it is his great desire to reconcile men, and the man, mankind, back to God. Reconciliation is a very uh, um, accurate and great word when we, we're talking about turning our back on God. <coughs> Think about a father and child or a, or a mother and child or, or, or maybe some family members that have turned their backs on each other because of the strain in their life. And guess what has to happen before backs get turned Back and they face each other and they go back into the relationship that they once had. Reconciliation. God said, the only way to reconcile with me is to deal with your sin. And God says that if you'll pray and you'll realize that your sin is worthy of death and hell and you'll ask me for forgiveness, I'll give it. All that is required of a person is to believe on Jesus Christ, that he was God, that he lived a pure and sinless life, that he died on the cross for your and I's sin, that he raised himself from the grave. That's it. We're told to confess our sin, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, and ask for forgiveness. And 1 John 1, 9 is still in the Bible. It says that he is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. It's not just that we're born with our backs to God. You and I as Christians, sometimes we, we turn our back on God. You say, I don't understand how that could be. Even after, by the way, repentance uh, in the New Testament comes from a word metanoia. It means change your mind or turn around. Isn't that interesting? The word repentance means to change your mind and turn around. And so when I've got my back to God and I'm doing whatever I want to do, if I repent of my sins, I turn my back on my sins and I put my face towards God. 
You see, Jeroboam went from obeying God to saying, you know what? I'm going to turn my back on God and his commandments, and I'm going to go back to my sin. It's easy for a Christian to do. You won't lose your salvation, by the way, if you're saved, but you'll lose the blessings of God on your life. Listen, I, I wonder if it can be said of us that we have always set the Lord before us as the number one priority in our life all the time. Because if he's not in front of you, where is he? He's behind you. Soon after salvation, many of us begin to revert back to the way we were. We, we get, when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior and we get that forgiveness of sin, it, it's a, such a wonderful feeling that we, we, we pour our life into God and we pour our life into the Word of God and we want to be around God's people as much as we can. And then something happens. Something happens to us. And circumstances of life seem to overshadow all the things that have taken place in our life. And, and, and our careers get in the way and, our, and our, our, our ambitions get in the way and our extracurricular activities get in the way. And, and certain, so at some point or another, we, we decide that our circumstances are so great that we have to deal with it this way, and we turn our backs on God. Anytime you turn your back on God, you turn your back on his blessings. We may not be doing what Jeroboam is doing. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that anyone in here is building calves and setting them up as altars. That's not what I'm saying. But can I tell you, anything that goes before God is an idol. It includes your job, your family, your children, your spouse, your career, your education, your ambitions. If it is more important to you and it supersedes everything else in your life to include God and what God has to say, it is an idol. If we, well, it's too cold this morning, but if we took a field trip to the neighborhoods around, around us, if it was a warmer day, I bet you'd find people washing their items or cutting their items trimming those bushes or casting the line out to catch their idol. Why? Because those things have superseded God. It's amazing to me, even in my own life, how that God can become so irrelevant to us that we'll justify skipping out on God's things, reading our Bible, spending time in prayer, being at the house of God, doors are open, and we'll justify it over and over again. You know what we've done? We've turned our back on God because of the circumstances in our life have changed. Go with me to Isaiah, chapter number 38. This is a much shorter portion of the message. In Isaiah, chapter number 38, you'll find that Hezekiah was a great man of God. He had a sin that cost him dearly. But I would dare say that we all have a sin that has cost us dearly from time to time. But by and large, you and I, if we would have looked at Hezekiah, we would have called him a good and godly king. Hezekiah is sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amoz, came unto him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. How would you like it if you were in a hospital and I came up to you and came to do, you know, do a hospital visit and to say, hey, you need to get your house in order because you're going to die. It's very encouraging for the man of God to come do something like that, right? Well, that's basically what Isaiah did to Hezekiah. It's the greatest hospital visit ever, right? But Hezekiah says this, it says to Hezekiah, it says this in verse number two, then Hezekiah turned his face towards the wall and prayed unto the Lord. You know what Hezekiah did? Y'all reading that with me? When Hezekiah was told that his life was at an end, he turned to God. It wasn't a far turn because he was already turned to God. It was a natural response to him. He did not, when he found a life circumstance that was out of his control and that he had no ability to deal with, he didn't go to another doctor and seek another opinion. He didn't try to go find a different cause, uh, 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 a different source of medical treatment. He didn't do all the things that the world would tell us to do. He turned to God Almighty. Instead, Jeroboam turned to idols and worldly wisdom. Hezekiah turned to God. He prays, and, and for the sake of time, we won't read his entire, uh, his entire writing. Verse number 9, it says, The writing of Hezekiah, king of Judah, when he had been sick, 
was recovered from the sickness, and it says, I said, and then he goes on and recounts the things that he said when he was recovering from his sickness. This is after God had already answered his prayer. He says in verse number 17, it says, Behold, for peace I have great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. You know what a Christian short be, uh, to say? It should not ever be said of a Christian, or anybody really, that you have turned your back on God. What it should, have, it should be said about us is that we should be able to say to God, God has cast all my sins behind his back, and that we are in perfect relationship with each other. Hezekiah had turned his back, he was born with his back to God. At what point he came to, came to God, I have no idea. Sometime before probably the age of uh, 25 when he came to power. He, he can echo David uh, in his mind, I think, in Psalm 51 where it says, My sin is ever before me. You see, when you and I sin is ever before us, it's easy for us to be close to God because we know we need it. When you forget how bad of a sinner you are, you'll turn your back on God in a hurry. You don't need him. You, after all, you're a good person, aren't you? And you don't need anything from God. But that is the place of greatest danger. Can I encourage you with one last verse? 1 John 1, 9. Let me read it in case I misquote it. If we confess our sins, he, being God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. A lot of times that, that verse is used as a, as a soul winning verse, as a, as a scripture as referencing salvation. First John was not written to lost people, it was written to, to the church, to Christians. It is just as necessary for a Christian to occasionally, or probably more than occasionally, realize that their life is a life that is currently with their backs towards God Almighty. You say, I haven't completely abandoned God in my life. I don't think Jeroboam completely abandoned God in his life either. You don't completely abandon God. Once God comes and saves you, you don't completely abandon God, but you certainly will turn from him. And by the way, checking a couple blocks off on your to-do list of religious duties is not serving God. That's appeasing conscience. We have to turn ourselves to God if we're ever going to see his blessing. The alternative, well, ask Jeroboam how that happened, how that worked out. You and I all love to hear about the blessings of God, don't we? Listen, that's why all these preachers who stand up on TV and tell you how great your life's going to be and, and how God's going to bless you, that's why people go to those churches. We love to hear it. And I'm not saying that the blessings of God are fake or false. I'm saying that they're qualified. You don't just get them because you're a child of God. You have to get them because you're being blessed for being an obedient child. I mean, it makes sense to us, right? If you're a parent here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Listen, I'd like to give my kids a dessert after dinner, but they're not going to get it if they act like heathens at the dinner table, right? I mean, it makes sense to you and I, doesn't it? Why do we expect God to bless us when we act like heathens at the dinner table? Or sometimes we don't even show up. We just do whatever we want to do. Don't expect God to bless you until you turn to him. And then he will. Are you standing this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed.